Welcome to the series that brings you the greatest motoring stories from across the continent. In this show... I find out if Ford's new baby cat can possibly be as good as the old one. Journalist Frank Jacobs is in Switzerland visiting Rinspeed, makers of the world's most outrageous concept cars. Johnny Smith drives the car Lancia are pinning their future on, the Delta. And racing driver Sabina Schmitz is in Abu Dhabi, driving the most exclusive supercar of them all, the Bugatti Veyron. Holy cow! The old Ford car was brilliant. It was a proper dinky slice of stylish fun and common sense. It cornered like a cart, it parked like a push bike, and it made girls feel girly without making the boys feel too silly. Now there's a new one, and it's come at the perfect time, because in this increasingly eco-friendly and cluttered world, small cars are cooler than ever. So the question today is this, does the new car have the same fun, style and common sense as the old one. Let's start with the fun bit. The driving. And the first thing you should know is that this isn't just a straight Ford. It's actually 80% Fiat. The car was developed alongside Fiat's 500 and it shares things like engines, drivetrains, even the structure of the chassis. Now, Ford reckon that they've tweaked the car up so it feels more sporty, so it's got more of that Ford family feel. I'm just not sure they've done enough. It just hasn't got that extra 10% of specialness that makes the Fiesta and the Focus so good to drive. They egg you on, they make you want to go faster because they're just so competent, so sporty. This just doesn't. It kind of tolerates you. I mean, the steering's really nice, everything's easily to hand. It's just too nice. We've come to expect more from Ford. Hmm. So for small car fun, the old version actually wins. So how does this one compare for small car style? After all, it's just as important to the hip kids that buy them. Well, it looks like a pygmy fiesta. Not a bad thing. But I can't see it looking fresh after 12 years like the old one. Ford's kinetic design theory is alive and well. Swept back headlights, sculptured sides and a big, bold grille. But little cars should have their own cheeky character, not a hand-me-down from their big brother. In here, it gets better, though it's not hard to spot Fiat's 500 DNA in the general layout. Mind you, instead of 1950s mock Bakelite, we do get this lovely centre console, some rather funky little air vents, very posh steering wheel, and a perfectly placed gear stick. In fact, ergonomics and materials use are pretty spot on throughout, though it has to be said, Fiat's 500 is more naturally quirky. This just feels a bit like it's been pimped. So, fun and style have slipped slightly. What about common sense? Well, the boot's up from 186 to 224 litres. And how about this for a big spec list for a tiny car? This thing gets optional side and curtain airbags. It's got a 6 CD player with optional Bluetooth and USB port. It gets hill start assist. It's got electronic brake force distribution, ABS, ESP, aircon. It's a lot of spec for a small car. But the biggest change is under the bonnet, because as well as a 1.2-litre petrol, you can now specify your cap with a 1.3-litre turbo diesel. Which I'm driving. And you've probably guessed by now that it's shared with the Fiat 500. The 75 PS engine manages a respectable 4.1 litres per 100 kilometres and is considerably more frugal than the petrol version. But it's worth noting that at around €13,000, a diesel cap will cost you about €3,000 more than a base petrol. Now, I usually prefer my small cars to have buzzy little petrol engines, but this chunkier-feeling cap actually suits the nature of the diesel. And with 145 newton metres at its disposal, it actually feels quite punchy. And that bodes very well for city driving. It feels more secure than the old car. It feels more stable, but the engine's still really strong. Now, that's good news if you're a learner driver being bullied by bigger cars. But I'm afraid that's still not quite enough to win me over. <laughs> 
this car has basically swapped the old version's cheeky charm for safety and sense, which, objectively, is a really good thing. The problem is that Fiat's 500 has 80% of the car's dynamics, but it's just a whole load more interesting. See, Ford's managed to strip all the Italian character out of the 500, but then they haven't replaced it with enough Ford talent of their own. If you want plain common sense, then the car delivers. But if you want that little something extra, well, I'm afraid it's lacking. This is the Swiss countryside. It's beautiful, it's green, and it's so quiet, you'd never expect something extreme happening here. But just around the corner, there's a factory that will blow your mind. This is the home of Rinspeed on the outskirts of Zurich. The company began 32 years ago by importing sunroofs from the USA and fitting them to European cars. But the owner, Frank Rinderknecht, had bigger and bolder ideas and in 1981 started building concept cars. Each year the factory produces another unique vehicle to stun the world. But they will never be duplicated or sold. So I started by asking him the most obvious question. So Frank, what intrigues me is how can you make a living out of building one-offs that will never go into production? Well, actually, we cannot live on building concept cars. We're losing out on each of these cars. We can recuperate partly from our partners. It's, let's say, a passion. It's an investment in communication in our future. And of course, we have to make up that money through our business for the automotive industry, for the supplier industry, yeah. to have at the end of the year a positive balance sheet. What's the most expensive car you've got here around? Each of our latest concept cars cost about 1 million euro. Is any of them for sale? No, our concept cars are not for sale. For any no. price? Uh, we keep them no price because they're not for sale. His latest creation is the Scuba, his most daring concept to date. The propellers are the clue. Yes, amazingly, this is an underwater car. Frank is a massive James Bond fan and took inspiration from The Spy Who Loved Me, where Roger Moore had an underwater Lotus Esprit. The Scuba is also based on a Lotus, this time an Elise. It's got three electric motors, one for the wheels and two for the fans that propel it underwater. Prefer being underwater rather than in it? This is the Extreme, a car that comes with its own hovercraft. And this is the Presto. It's based on a Mercedes A-Class, although it's difficult to recognize since Frank got hold of it. It runs on a mix of natural gas and diesel, has words for indicators and a custom Eibach suspension. You might have already said, wow, just looking at it, but if you haven't, just watch this. But just remember to get your passengers out first. This also caught my eye, the X-axis. Built to mark Rinspeed's 30th birthday, it's made from a pioneering plastic called Macrolon. The floor is transparent, so you can actually see the tarmac rushing underneath when you drive it. The chassis is made of aluminium. It's really, really light and strong. And because it's so light, only 750 kilogram, although this engine only has 150 PS, it's very fast. In fact, the X-axis will get to 100 in just 4.8 seconds and on to a top speed of 210 kph. I've been here for a few hours, but now I've come to this awkward point where I really need to ask Frank for the keys to a car. And I have made my decision. This is the Senso. And like all of Rinspeed's cars, there's a particular technology to be showcased. The Senso tackles the subject of driver alertness. A computer can be installed to download the driver's biometric data, such as heart rate and blood pressure. The Senso then uses a combination of colors, music and even fragrances to maintain the right balance of stimulation and relaxation. Although the opportunity to drive this car was stimulation enough for me. 
mean, I feel like Batman. All the girls are smiling at me. Can't be me. Never happens when I drive my own car. A Porsche Boxster gave its life for it, but it was worth the offer. The chassis, engine and other mechanics all come from a Porsche Boxster. With sides like cliff faces, you might expect the Senso to weigh several tons. But the use of modern materials means it's only a fraction heavier than the 1300 kilo sports car it's based on. It even accelerates like a Boxster, but I don't dare trying that because, as I said, it's a one-off. It's worth more than a million euros. And if I crash this, I might as well die. Still to come on Fifth Gear Europe, Johnny discovers a Lancia with animal tendencies. And what does that backside remind you of? A beaver, hunched over. And Sabina driving the world's greatest supercar in the world's wealthiest city. I love it! I'd like to talk to you about Lancia. I reckon they're a bit like pizza margarita. Here in Italy, very popular. In the rest of Europe, they are... average. Which is a bit of a shame, really, because they've racked up their fair share of firsts. The first production car in Europe to have an electrical system for headlights, the first with a V6 engine, and the first with a five-speed gearbox. Well, now they're hoping to recapture everyone's imagination with this, the new Delta. They're hoping to shift 80,000 of these a year, and by 2010, 300,000. 300,000, that is extraordinarily ambitious, given that the current four models in the Lancia range last year sold a total of 118,000. So what makes them so confident? Well, I'm not sure at the moment. I'm not one to judge a book by its cover, but, but well, it looks like, what's the word I'm looking for? Beaver. Not only that, a beaver, mid nor slightly startled. I can't believe how strange looking this car is. It's got actual dentistry. I think it's the only car in the world to have actual dentistry. I believe every 20,000 miles, this area here grows and you have to take it into the dealership and they have to file this back. But you know, this whole beaver theme doesn't stop at the front. Oh no, look, it doesn't have a roof. It has a sleek, dark pelt. And what does that backside remind you of? A beaver, hunched over. In fact, I don't think this runs on diesel. It runs on mulched logs. So there's nothing in the looks department to inspire massive sales. Maybe the specifications are going to be the temptation. There are three to choose from, Argento, Oro and Platino. This, the highest spec Platino, boasts dual zone climate control, two-tone paintwork and 17-inch alloys. All good stuff, but nothing that's going to get people into the showrooms. Lancia say Delta is a mathematical symbol that stands for change and evolution. But it also means something else. It means a landform that has occurred from where a river meets the sea or an estuary, leaving deposits. And guess where beavers live? Rivers. However, things improve dramatically once you drive the Delta. Lancia pioneered the V6 engine. But you haven't got a V6 in this car and there won't be an option. All of the engines are four-cylinder, three petrols, three diesels. Prices start at €21,500 for the basic petrol models, but it's the diesels most people will go for, and this is the top-of-the-range 1.9-litre twin-turbo version. It kicks out an impressive 192 PS, getting the car to 100 kph in under eight seconds and onto a top speed of 222 kph. Yet its thirst for diesel is a mere 5.3 litres per 100 kilometres. If you were to judge its performance on its styling, you'd probably assume that it'd be a bit flabby and a bit lazy on the corners, but actually it tucks in quite nicely and changes direction better than I thought it would. Car feels pretty planted in corners. The steering's pretty direct. The brakes are good. It's quiet. It's very quiet in here. The cabin noise is low. Lancia have been damn brave with this car. They've pitched it up against the biggest competitive segment in the whole of Europe. It's the large hatch market. 
And because there's a lot of competition, this car's got to be good. It's claiming to be Italy's answer to the Lexus. That's a sweeping statement. But I don't think that claim is far off the mark. Lots of soft touch materials, some nice chrome inserts, and Ferrari style stitch steering wheel give the Delta a real quality feel. OK, so we've established the front is quite luxurious, but it's actually better back here in the Delta. Now, don't forget, this is a hatchback car that's a bit bigger than a Ford Focus and smaller than a Mondeo. But you've got this. I can go forwards and then I can recline and I've still got leg room and I'm six foot three. I've got plenty of headroom when the seat's upright, plenty of knee room, split air conditioning. Do you know what's been bothering me all day? I'm trying to work out what this car feels like and it almost feels like a my back. It's got very questionable looks and a lot of people will probably dislike it, but there's no doubting the inside's very luxurious. And I like it. But then I like a lot of ugly cars. Up until the 1950s, the United Arab Emirates didn't really have an economy. It just had a big desert and people who herded camels. But then they found oil and everything changed. The Middle East is rapidly becoming a supercar capital of the world. Investment firms have bought stakes in Aston Martin and Ferrari. Specialist Juno Roof has opened a factory here and sales of 300 kph cars to oil-rich shakes are surging. Not surprising when petrol costs just 40 cents a litre. Here in Abu Dhabi is one of the most exclusive car dealerships in the world. Princess Auto specializes in rare supercars where customers come from all over the globe, many of whom are wealthy enough to buy more than one at a time. But there is one car that is expensive even for the super rich. It is the ruler in the land of the supercar, the Bugatti Viron. This 1.1 million euro car has a top speed of 408 kilometers per hour. It's not 200 time, it's just two and a half seconds. It's the car that everyone dreams of driving just once. And now it's my turn. <laughs> and not one, not two, not three, it has four turbochargers. It produces 1,001 PS and 1,250 Newton meters of torque. That's a lot. That kind of performance creates a lot of heat particularly when you are in a desert that often over 40 degrees. That's why there is no engine cover and it's fitted with 10, yes, 10 radiators. Of course, you don't always have to go fast. What's impressive is that it's also good at going slow. The good thing in this car is you can drive slowly, very smooth, cruise around, have a look. It's not that hard to drive like a Porsche Carrera GT. This is really drivable, like a proper car. And that's what I like most. I want to go fast if I like to, and I want to go smooth if I go shopping, you know? The overview in the car is not too bad, like it looks from the outside. I feel like I'm driving just a normal road car. Except when you accelerate, the car starts shaking, like it gets angry, and then after a while, it goes forward like hell. Now this is the fifth gear. Fifth gear is quite comfortable, but if you rev it high in lower gears, I promise, it's like a space shuttle or something like that. It's amazing. Although it's not perfect, the car suffers from a lot of turbo lag, 
which I found frustrating. Also, it's not very economical. Drive it flat out and you will empty the 100 liter fuel tank in just 12 minutes. But I don't care, because the six-speed DSG gearbox gives you seamless changes. The cross-trill turbine vented carbon brakes generate 1G of braking. That sound is amazing. And the engine is a work of art. I won't get out of this car. I love it! The Veyron may be three years old and lost its title of fastest production car to the SSC Ultimate Aero. But it's still the most amazing car in the world if only for the way it makes you feel. If I owned an oil field, I would definitely be spending my money on one of these.